Hi and welcome everybody. I am so, so excited for today's very special guest interview with Liz Parrish. Liz, hi and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I was so happy when you reached out. I'm, I can't believe that you answered and you saw my message. I'm so excited. Uh, I have been following your work for a very long time. I teach at Miami Dade College and so every once in a while I teach a nutrition course. But every semester, I make sure that I go off on a rant on anti-aging <laughs> and I show them some of the videos where you did the genetic therapies that your company, BioViva, has um, come up with. And, uh, you know, we talk about all that stuff. So, but Well, before... what good is nutrition and exercise unless you're actually going to live longer and healthier, right? So exactly. you're, you're right in there. And I love supporting women that are doing podcasts, doing education in this space. I mean, you know, we need to uh, tether to each other uh, to move forward. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. Um, before we start, can you give our audience a quick little overview of um, your company, BioViva, and what you're working on right now? Yeah, so my company is BioViva, and we work on a genetic cure for biological aging. So we look at gene therapies, uh, genes that right now we work with a human set of genes uh, that are associated with longer, healthier lifespans. And um, our goal is to create longer, healthier life for you so that um, you can get more uh, from your time on the planet and you spend less time in ill health. And can you share a little bit also about the first treatment that, I don't know if it was the first treatment, but I know that you were patient zero for some of the treatments like telomerase injections that you had to travel outside of the United States to get it done, right? Yeah. So in 2015, we started the company with me taking the first two gene therapies to treat biological aging. And one had never been done in a human, and that was the telomerase reverse transcriptase. And the other one was to uh, increase my muscle mass. And actually, uh, a fun thing to say is we have a, I have a paper coming out with uh, Bill Andrews, who that it actually addresses uh, the need uh, for a new medical route in the United States so that people who want to participate in new and experimental medicine that outstrips uh, today, today's prescribed medicine could actually get access to those right in the United States or within the country that you live in. And, and that's going to be crucial. So you had to do it because there are other steps that like, or other studies that the FDA required. Is that why you couldn't do it in the United States back then? Yeah, so um, being the CEO of a company, there was kind of like a gray, gray area where maybe I could have participated in my own therapeutic, but it was uncertain and certainly any medical doctors around that doing that sort of treatment in the United States that's unregulated could have fallen under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So we felt that it was best to just go outside of the United States, outside of this regulatory zone and do the uh, treatment there. So you did the telomerase um, enzyme injection and you did the myostatin inhibitor, correct? Yeah, they're both genes. One of them is called HTERT and it codes for the enzyme telomerase and that enzyme lengthens telomeres. And the other one is the fullostatin gene and it codes for uh, a myostatin blocker. So myostatin regulates your muscle growth and it blocks myostatin from doing that in, in making it so that you can create uh, denser, stronger muscles. So, okay, I, it's the actual gene. I, I thought it was the enzymes. That's great. All right. Yeah, the great thing about gene therapy is um, it's a one-time injection that should last for years and years and years. Unlike, you know, some of the medicine that we take today in which we might have to take over and over again. Right, exactly. And that was back in 2015. How has your experience been with that so far in 2022? Well, uh, it's, it's been really good. You know, at the time we were, we really didn't know what would happen. And now, you know, we have uh, some good results. You know, I continue to stay healthy. So as a safety test, it was um, a success. 
And then what we look for, of course, is efficacy. What happened over that time? So there's different ways to measure biological aging. And if you measure them by telomere length, um, my telomere length uh, got longer. And therefore, my biological age, as far as my telomere length, um, got smaller. So my uh, biological age of my cells, as far as my telomeres, are in the late 20s, early 30s, whereas chronologically, I'm 51. Um, and then uh, we look at other markers too, like blood glucose and uh, metabolic uh, health, and those were also improved. So I was 44 when I took the uh, gene therapy. You, you easily look like you are in your 30s, early 30s. Like there is no oh. way that you're in your 50s. That's incredible. And that's uh, thank good you. advertisement <laughs> for BioViva. <laughs> so um, let's start with why should people care about anti-aging and what uh, BioViva and other companies are doing? Because I feel like, there isn't as much passion and enthusiasm as I feel around me surrounding that topic. So yeah, what mm -hmm. you say? yeah. Well, I think that a lot of people are like I was, and um, they just think of aging as being a natural process in which we inevitably die from, and that heart disease and cancer and um, dementia are unstoppable. And, and I actually believed that as well. I mean, I, I didn't really think too much about it. In 2013, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and I learned for the first time what disease really was. I, I had already been spending two years of my time for the advocacy of the use of stem cells and fell in love with genetics. What's happening behind the stem cell? Why a stem cell has the same genes as every other cell in your body, but it has the ability to regenerate you. So I'd already fallen down the hole of falling in love with genetics and looking at what was happening in gene therapy when my son was diagnosed. And, you know, I realized after visiting a couple of conferences that my grandmothers had died of Alzheimer's, but I hadn't seen all of the ugliness of it. I just sadly lost my grandmothers over time and visited them a couple of times, but actually the disease was quite, quite brutal. And whether you're eight years old or nine years old or 90 years old, disease is brutal and horrible. And we really, not only did, was I looking for cures for childhood disease, but I don't want to just have a cure for my child for him to just live a couple more decades before he dies of some other horrible disease. When you look at genetics, we can actually take care of all of this at one time. By treating an aging population with therapies associated with reversing or slowing the aging process, we will create cures for kids more expeditiously and be able to create a world in which we even the playing field of health for everyone. So aging associated non-communicable diseases are the biggest killer on the planet. And every gene that our company looks at that targets aging actually also would have a beneficial effect on ch childhood disease. So, you know, they, it's not one or the other. And with over 100,000 people of dying every day of aging associated diseases, these people could be consenting like I did to treatment that would therefore spearhead a better future for our children, if not only themselves. You know, so this is kind of one of those dual use situations where people who are sick or suffering from aging could participate in therapeutics to make a better world for everyone. And so it just seemed like when I was looking for cures for my son's disease, this was actually the fastest route to get there and one that I assumed everyone would be excited uh, to participate in. Right. And how are you finding the level of um, excitement, if you want, around you, like the, just the general public? Well, I think that the, you know, they, as they say, if it bleeds, it leads. I think that, you know, vastly bad news uh, spreads much faster like fire than good news. Um, I think that the general public is starting to see that treating aging is possible. 
uh, Google put a couple billion dollars into it, what, in 2014 or something like that. And now Jeff Bezos is getting into it with his company, Altos, and he is, you know, committed to $3 billion or something like that for that company. This is the type of charge that we need to see happen. At, but, you know, smaller companies like my companies are more agile and can move more quickly in the space. And so, you know, we hope to get support as well. But look, anyone uh, taking on aging, I 100% support, you know, we we have to work together because it's actually really complex. Even no, not one big company can treat everyone in the world. So I'm really excited about it. And I think that the public excitement is growing but still people veer towards bad news over good news. And this is the first time that the good news is so good that I think it's a little shocking. So if we can get attention away from uh, some bad news towards good news, you know, maybe we can uh, really change the game. I mean, you know, in the future of things like war um, in which we are experiencing now, you know, vastly should be globally illegal. Uh, with uh, people who live healthier and longer, uh, certainly um, it would be a tragedy to kill somebody who might have lived a healthy 200 years, right? Yeah. And this also changes the playing field. We shouldn't send, you know, children to war. This is a war that actually old people can fight for children. And isn't that a game changer? You know, so Anyway, um, I'm hoping that, you know, the public is getting excited about this and that soon we'll have a airing out a break in which people can pay more attention to these new and emerging technologies than the tragedy and the devastation that has currently been going on with COVID, which is vastly aging associated yeah. um, and, um, and th this terrible war. Yeah, exactly. And I think just planting the seed that aging is reversible and there is a ton of data that shows us that we can do it. Just planting that seed allows people to think differently about death, that it's no longer an inevitability. It could be your choice. You could have that choice if you want to. And not only that, it is the root cause, like you said, of every single major chronic disease from heart disease to diabetes. You know, why do these things happen as you age? Why doesn't, why they, they don't generally happen when you're 18, right? And so if we can target the root cause of all major chronic diseases, wouldn't that be amazing for the quality of life of you and your loved ones and your friends and family? So absolutely. So yeah, so when, one of the things that we look at is a paper that came out in 2013, and it's been expanded on and debated since, but really, it really boils down to the nine hallmarks of aging. There are more, um, including, you know, the microbiome uh, in your intestine that also is, supports uh, healthy aging. But the nine hallmarks of aging actually give us targets to start with. So those are the things that are happening at the cellular level that actually are the disease that end up leading to the symptoms, which are things like dementia and heart disease and cancer. And so, you know, by targeting these, uh, we will expedite therapeutics that work for what's called all-cause mortality, meaning that people die from... So if you, if you cured cancer today, you would only expand lifespan by two to four years for the average person. A lot of people don't know that. If you cured heart disease, you know, you're looking at maybe four years average lifespan increase. It's because these diseases or these symptoms of the diseases of aging are actually um, just, you know, the symptoms. So if you don't die of heart disease, you die of cancer or dementia or organ failure of, of a variety of sorts. So we have the ability to target the hallmarks of aging, which will probably each one of them become their own disease, and we'll have therapies to target those. Uh, we just had a paper come out in PNAS uh, that we worked on for about three years, uh, which is why this all takes so long. And, the, and what we tried to do and what we accomplished is 
creating a new de delivery method for gene therapy uh, called, it's a, an old virus that basically you take its ability to get people sick out and it delivers genes. And this one can deliver multiple genes. You know, it has a, a large carrying capacity and that's what we need for something like aging. So if we look at the hallmarks of aging, if we just use something like telomerase reverse transcriptase, we actually target several of the hallmarks of aging. So we could reverse the effects of several of those, but not all of those. And so the ability to uh, deliver multiple genes that target all of those hallmarks, and then, you know, then the, starts the debate, is there anything left that needs to be targeted? Well, then we've got to find a, a treatment for it as well. Uh, but this is, this is the goal, is to create the combinatorial therapy uh, that will work as precision medicine in humans, and then being able to add or um, delete certain uh, additions depending on the person's human health. For some people, a very small percentage of the people, they're called myostatin knockouts, so they might not need something like folostatin. And then for other people who have something like hemophilia A or hemophilia B, they would need another gene in order to not have that disease on top of curing aging. So it gives us an interesting prospect to maybe uh, be able to do a one and done or a one every five to 10 year type treatment to keep you healthier longer. How much time would you guesstimate that it would take for these new treatments to become accessible to the public? And I'm not saying cheap and accessible, just accessible. Even if- Well, they like, should be inexpensive too, because, you know, yeah, so- Yeah, eventually, right? Yeah, gene therapies are right now the most expensive drug on the planet for the regulated and approved gene therapies, but that's because they're for monodent Genic, monogenic, very rare diseases. Okay, so you, you spent a billion dollars creating a drug and there's only, let's say, a hundred people who need it. So that becomes very expensive. But when you're treating aging associated diseases, it's everyone on the planet. So by scale, we should be able to bring the price down significantly. Now, the paper that I'm working on now that should be out in a week or so is called the Best Choice Medicine Plan. And it would make it so these treatments would be available immediately upon approval by a government of this plan to people who have terminal illness or no other treatment for their condition. Um, and then the data from those studies would be used towards a regulatory route. That's what I'm really pushing for because a lot of people need access to these type of medicines immediately. Okay. But for the rest of the public, they would have to wait for these therapies to get through a regulatory body. And in the U.S., that's, you know, it could be up to 20 years. That's the problem. The medicine that you take today, the medicine that your doctor can prescribe is old medicine. Yeah. I mean, you know, we work at a rate faster than, you know, computing now. I mean, the, the what we have the ability to do now, it just outstrips what we were able to do, you know, just a few years ago. So, you know, really you know, people have to demand. Exactly. And, and we have to say, well, if a vaccine that is a brand new kind of technology was rolled out and delivered and even mandated in some instances in less than a year, like the moment it came out, then what does that say about all the anti-aging medicine technologies that we have? Exactly. We're, we're moving way too slow. So we could bring out a COVID vaccine in a year, and yet people who are dying of dementia today can't even get access, you know, to a study that we already did uh, with, a, with a medical tourism company, you know, two years ago. Um, you know, it, it's, it's terrible. You know, um, AIDS also is a great example of patient advocacy. You know, patients and and advocates came out and they marched on Washington and they said, we demand access to new therapeutics. Um, HIV is a good ex um, kind of situation in two ways. Number one, people demanded access. So they got access to drugs within a year also. They, they demanded it and they got it. Number two, it's also a good example of probably one target isn't enough, just like um, aging, because the cocktails for today's AIDS or HIV patients is um, a multi-combinatorial uh, 
product. It's not, it doesn't just target one thing. So, you know, demanding access, getting access to new technology and better technology as it rolls out and as the combinatorial uh, therapies roll out is really what we need to do. Yeah. And I think, like you said, it starts with us because if the general perception regarding aging changes away from an inevitability towards it's a chronic disease and we have the ability to cure it eventually or at least slow it down until we can reverse it, then that can push the FDA to look at aging as a disease because right now it is not classified as a disease. That's why they don't even give out grants, right? And I mean, the NIH grants, are the, the main way that research happens. That's where most of the money comes from, so. Yeah, and it, it is a disease. Um, I've been saying that since 2013 and I got swiftly removed from a board uh, for saying that <laughs> in 2013, but it is a disease. It, it, it's biological aging. We want you to get chronologically older. There's no shame in getting older. We're all doing it and we should be proud of it. But biological aging is, is certainly a disease. And unless we take it seriously and call it a disease, we can't do as much about it as we could otherwise. Exactly. So right now um, you're working, or actually maybe you can share, um, what are the main treatments that are available at BioViva that you're working on? So, I mean, that's kind of the sad thing. So BioViva is a U.S. company. We can't offer access to any medicine through us. Um, it would be illegal. We do work with medical tourism companies and we work with them to assess data. So we're not able to treat patients, but we can assess data. Mm -hmm. So there's a company that we work with um, called Integrative Health Systems. And for people who qualify, they have to talk to a medical doctor. Um, and go through a process, but if they qualify, uh, they can get consensual access to therapies through them. And if they sign off and allow us to, we get to assess the data. Uh, we will be uh, trying to raise money to do our own dementia study. So they did a dementia study, we assessed the data, and now we want to raise money to do a, a, another one to actually see if we can reproduce the data that they got in their study with more patients with with a higher dose of the therapy with an IRB approval, um, trying to do it at a level in which the US FDA would notice and um, therefore going to uh, expedited use of the drug. And so we're going to be doing that later this year with a nonprofit raising money for that trial. So you, you are getting IRB approval for working with humans in the United States right now. Well, this would be outside of the United States still. And the reason that we would do that is actually about 80% of all clinical trials, even from the biggest companies in the world are done offshore. And they are done that way because it actually brings cost savings to patients. So uh, getting an IRB approval is one thing, but actually having a trial in which a company and patients can afford is another thing. And so by doing a uh, cl clinical trial offshore, it gives us the ability to save money, uh, therefore giving better service to the patients. Okay, that's great. And um, you, you mentioned the telomerase, um, it's the enzyme that for, for my audience, I, some of them, I think most of them know probably because I talk a lot about anti-aging. Um, but for those who aren't familiar, telomerase is an enzyme that uh, goes back and um, elongates the length of the telomeres, which are the caps at the end of your chromosomes, which house your DNA and protects your DNA from um, basically, well, yeah, it protects your DNA. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So you do have that, right? In working on that, you, ha you have myostatin inhibitor, which um, helps put back muscle and prevents the age-related uh, muscle decline or muscle loss, which is called sarcopenia. Yep. And you mentioned clotho. Yeah. Okay. I I'm yeah. not very familiar with that part. Clotho is a cool gene. It is a geroprotector. Um, okay, so there's some, okay, the, the benefits of it are protection against cardiovascular disease, 
chronic kidney disease and cognitive decline. And so when they looked at people who had had uh, Alzheimer's upon autopsy after death, but didn't have the cognitive decline associated with Alzheimer's, they are natural clotho upregulators. So they have more clotho in their body than the average person. And uh, people who are protected against uh, chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease as well. So this is a really important geroprotector um, and cognitive enhancer potentially. You know, that's what we're, we're testing it for in the um, dementia study. We're testing both uh, telomerase reverse transcriptase and the clotho. Okay. Um, is there anything else, any other major treatments? Um, I'm going to ask you about NAD other than NAD. Is there anything else that you're working on? So we're working on, um, we're still studying PGC1-alpha. It's a gene that you upregulate when you exercise. And so, you know, any of these genes that might help with um, things like obesity, uh, with, a, with the current crisis in type 2 diabetes and, and uh, obesity. So it is uh, a gene that regulates uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, meaning that it helps you have better and healthier mitochondria in your cells and your mitochondria are your powerhouse of your cells. So um, this has to do with your energy production. And um, again, this is the gene that is upregulated, one of the genes that's upregulated when you exercise. And so this could be uh, beneficial to uh, the obesity and metabolic disorder population. Cool. And then, of course, we're looking at the reprogramming factors. And then there's a few other genes that we're looking at as well. There's a couple that we go back and forth on. Um, but, you know, the idea is to accumulate as many as possible. And then over the years in research, which is very expensive for us, to find out what happens to these genes uh, when they're combined, uh, of course, eventually in a human organism. So fascinating. Um, with the NAD, um, do you work with that? The NAD plus injections? We don't. Um, so NAD um, is great. Um, we were doing, we were for a while carrying some tests that actually test for NAD. Um, it is kind of like the currency exchange in your cells. And so it's really important, but you know, that we do have a question as to if we could completely restore a cell, would it have natural NAD uh, metabolism anyway? You know, would, would it's, you know, would all of these lower level signaling um, uh, substances actually be improved? And so, you know, that's probably something that we will find out down the road. Right, if it's a downstream effect, then yeah, what's the point of it? It's, it's kind of like just putting a band-aid on the issue. Yeah, sometimes we don't know what's a downstream effect and what's a, you know, we, we do know some of the upstream. We're trying to see how far upstream we can go. And, you know, that's really where we're going to have the, the most benefit is, is fixing the cell and then seeing, you know, what happens to the whole organism and the, and the downstream effects. Yeah. And I think also a really interesting thing for people to get excited about this is also fertility because female fertility, like ideally, I remember when I was going through school to become a dietitian, it was like you're, the, I, the best time to get pregnant is between 25 and 35. And after that, it becomes high risk, right? And a lot of people are struggling with that nowadays. And so the, the same anti-aging treatment is the same treatment that's going to treat the root cause of declining fertility. And women are becoming more independent, more educated, they're working, they're delaying starting a family. And so by the time they're ready, it's become harder, right? So I yeah, think that it doesn't really, it's not really great for our species anymore to, you know, have your healthiest children be born to, you know, late teens, early 20s, you know, it, it doesn't really make sense. And so I do have one researcher that's looking into that and seeing if there's ability to decouple um, the maturity of the eggs from age. And so there were some good studies done with PRP and the regeneration of um, 
ovaries in order to uh, help infertile women become fertile again. But the push towards regenerating uh, the uh, ovaries is, is vastly different. And there hasn't been a lot of work in that space. So, um, you know, some people believe that we're born with so many eggs. This is women, of course. And that when we get to the end of those, it doesn't matter if you reverse aging, you're just literally um, to the end uh, of your viable uh, ova. But um, I think it will be interesting to watch this space. I imagine that in the future that anyone will be able to have a child just by using cells from their own body. And um, maybe, maybe women don't carry children anymore. I don't know. It seems strange to me. I'm a mother of two children. And it was just such a pivotal point in my life that um, I can't imagine things being done differently. But then I try to be open-minded. Open so anyway, what I'm saying is uh, maybe in the future, um, there will be no limit for uh, various reasons. Maybe people will have solved the problem in, in many ways. But if you are going to live for some 500 years, I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll be considered dangerous to right. <laughs> be pregnant and have a child. I don't know. You know, we don't know. We have to be flexible and, and figure out. But um, maybe it'll be the same and maybe there'll be much better ways to do it. Maybe... Uh, will go on to have uh, many children. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> very difficult to, 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 to tell, you know, so, so many variables um, play into that. But yeah, let's, let's not freak people out. <laughs> let's no, just... let's, not freak you, let's not freak you out. But, you know, I mean, there's so much, like, sometimes I think, I'm not trying to freak anyone out. I'm just trying to, like, say that there may be a myriad of ways that if you haven't done some things in your life that you really feel are important to you to do, there may be a myriad of ways to come to the same conclusion and have the same outcome in the future that are not limited to our biology today or what we know about our biology today. And yeah. so, um, you know, maybe we reverse aging and you're able to have children for, you know, hundreds of years if you want to. Um, or maybe there are other solutions, but mostly what I'm trying to impart is that don't worry about it because um, people are really working on these things. I mean, if you're super worried, start a company around it and you'll become the expert. Right. That's true. I know after reading about your biography, it's a very exciting about, you know, Go, following your passion and something that you're very interested in and, and creating a career out of it. And so, you know, you're, it's, it doesn't feel like work anymore. It's, it's what you would have done anyway, right? Yeah, it really doesn't feel like work. I mean, some people say, oh, you work all the time. And, and I think I don't work at all because, you know, this is, this is what I'm passionate about. And it's really important for women or anyone watching women and men or however you identify um, that you don't limit yourself to the things that you can achieve and do because it doesn't take a person with a certain type of degree or anything. It, all it takes is a mindset because in the world of translation, translating especially science to humans, we need everyone. We need every skill set and every story uh, in order to impart upon the public that, you know, now is the time. And so if you're interested in this space, don't feel limited by what you know now. Think of what you could know in five years if you put your head down and start studying it. Let me ask you something a little bit. Well, you tell me if you want to answer. Um, do you think that if people, because a lot of people in the world are religious, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that holding religious beliefs and believing that there is an afterlife can lower the level of enthusiasm with regards to getting after the anti-aging? Because if you believe that there's something afterwards, then there's not as much pressure in your life right now to reframe death or, you know, reframe aging, right? Have I you thought of that? Yeah, I think it's a really good question because um, like occasionally I run across someone who says, um, you know, maybe that, you know, 
medicine is against God, but, and yet there are people who take medicine and they wear clothes and they wear eyeglasses and things like that. And so I think that that's just limited thinking in the sector because I've also spoken with uh, Christians, Catholics, um, Mormons, uh, who actually 100% believe in, in their religious uh, text that this technology is given to man by God, in their right. case, uh, for people to use for the betterment. And that, it, that like, for instance, there's a myriad of uh, different takes on this from a, a bunch of different religions. So I'm just, I'm picking on Christianity right now. Um, but that Jesus cure was, you know, he wanted to cure all disease. And so this literally is the text coming to them and that God said you would live for hundreds of years if you followed his way, which in their mindset is the way of science. This is technology that is slowly being given to us through researchers uh, to use. So um, some vastly, deeply religious people deeply, deeply believe uh, in science and that that is God speaking to them through humans in order to solve our problems. Um, I, I've even uh, sat uh, live on stage and, and talked to the Dalai Lama, uh, which is uh, Buddhism, which is different. Um, and um, he was, he was for it. He was, he definitely approved of it. He was concerned that bad people would live longer, but then, you know, I mean, all of us are sort of a mosaic of, of many moral dispositions. And so perhaps um, most people we know are good. Uh, so perhaps that is a problem that would solve itself in the future it does seem that like bad people tend to want power maybe in the future power could be shared or held or ai would help with rules and laws and people would you know uh be behind it to ensure that it was as fair as as possible and so you know um, it seems like the religious people that I vastly talk to, most of them, of course, they are the people who find me, um, but they're very supportive of it, and it very much speaks to um, what they believe. Uh, but um, certainly there are people um, who think that, you know, they don't realize that they live longer through science and technology, and they think that anything new is scary. I mean, yeah. we, we've all been around, you know, little kids who are like, you know, you try to feed them something new, and they're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that older people sometimes are just you know, the same way. We, we never, we don't really have time to grow up in some 90 years, right? Like we still are kind of yeah. children. And so some people are just looking at the plate and they're going, no, broccoli. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some people get a, a, like a reaction when anything is new, it takes them longer to adapt, which brings me back to Charles Darwin, when he said the, the fittest, like the, the fittest, uh, the survival of the species I'm, I'm so destroying this right now, but that's okay. <laughs> I do that all the time so and I'm good. still, I love it. I'm still listening. I like your version better so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> like the survival of the fittest. He has a quote about how um, the species that survives is not the strongest nor the fastest, but the one that is most adaptable to change. And so that's a food for thought for success overall in general. And I think that can help people um, embrace anti-aging and longevity and not be scared of it or apprehensive. Okay. Liz, um, I wanted to ask you just one thing that I think people might um, be hesitant about. And that is um, concerns regarding cancer, because I feel like that's the number one thing that comes up every time we talk about treatments for aging. W what are your thoughts on that? Well, one of the fears was telomerase reverse transcriptase might exasperate, exasperate cancer. And actually in animal studies, it doesn't. It, it reduces the incident of cancer. And so actually lengthening our telomeres 
will probably help us live longer without cancer. For instance, keeping your chromosomes healthy and protected with the, the telomerase reverse transcriptase or the, the caps at the ends of the chromosomes is essential to um, not getting cancer. So uh, I, I think that you know in the future, uh, we will see that anti-aging is the way to go towards not actually getting cancer. So you can see that cancer rates uh, go up exponentially by the time you're 65 years old. And so these are the type of things that we want to keep from happening. Right. And if you had any worries yourself, you wouldn't have injected the treatments into your body, right? So, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when anyone takes uh, a therapy, uh, anything can happen in uh, a person, right? So pharmacogenetics would say that, um, you know, if you treated 20,000 people, something could go wrong with aspirin. So, you know, the, the truth is, is that, you know, as we test these therapies, we assume uh, with the data that we have already and the data that was in animal studies, that they will be uh, the safer therapies for most people across the board. There could be outliers and um, that happens with any drug, but probably less so with the gene therapies since they're more exact than most of the old treatments. Right. So how can our audience support BioViva's work and support the mission that you're on? Spread good, good news. <laughs> so you can uh, like and share uh, the information that we have, you know, um, encourage governments to look at this technology as a uh, viable technology, which you demand access to. Um, encourage, you know, people through social media to invest in this type of technology, no matter what company we support all companies in the aging space, because we will all need to work together in, in order to cure it. Yeah, exactly. And you, you do have um, a YouTube channel. I'm going to link it below. I'm going to link your website um, and uh, ways that people can connect with you easily. And the last question for you, Liz, um, what is next for the next five years for you and your company? Well, you know, now we want to get into proper human studies. We'd like to start clinical trials and we want to continue to develop our CMV gene therapy delivery um, in order to, you know, actually cure aging. And so, you know, we're, we're working with combinatorial genes now and we think that that's what it's going to take. And so, you know, we'll be, we'll be really busy <laughs> over the next five years. I can imagine, of course. Well, thank you so much, Liz. I know that you're super busy and I want to be respectful of your time, but cannot tell you how much I appreciate our chat today. Thank you so much for supporting this channel of Ken coming over and for everybody um, who has watched till the end, hopefully we can start effecting change and start reframing aging as um, something that we have a lot more control over than what we were told. So thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you for watching. If you like this content, make sure you give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that notification bell icon so YouTube alerts you every time I post a new video. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.